Hi everyone, as you are coming in, welcome. If everybody wants to, I'm Jada from Boober. This is Julie Rosen, IVCLC, Board Certified Lactation Consultant. Hi everybody. We'll tell you about ourselves in a little bit. Um, while you're coming in, can you just let us know when you're due or actually how many weeks pregnant are you if you're pregnant or if you have a baby how how old is your baby and let us know where you live right now and drop that into the chat while we're waiting for everybody to come in which would be great 35 weeks and where do you live also that would be super, really fun to hear 38 weeks in central new jersey 32 weeks jersey city 32 weeks in alaska you think you're first from alaska 35 weeks in arkansas that might be our first also, two month old in California, 35 weeks in Chicago, 32 weeks North Jersey, Hoboken, 36 weeks in Connecticut, 38 weeks in Carroll Gardens right near me, uh, six weeks old in Orlando, 33 weeks in Brooklyn, but in Boston, 39 weeks in Philadelphia, 32 weeks in Austin, so fun. Um, 35 weeks in New York City, Brooklyn, Doula from Chicago, two months old in Philly, five week old in Vermont, 13 week old baby girl in Ithaca, 29 weeks in Park Slope nearby, hi. 38 weeks in Orange, California. Three weeks old in New York, Carroll Gardens too. Seven weeks old in Brooklyn. 39 and a half in Brooklyn, but in Indiana. Um, 33 weeks in Harlem. 37 weeks in Brooklyn. 41 weeks and three days. That mm -hmm. is very soon in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. We know you're gonna have a baby soon. Five weeks old in Ozone Park. 26 weeks in Pittsburgh and 29 weeks in Kensington. Wow, that's exciting. Um, so great, great to have all of you here, um, four weeks old in Gowanus. So we have a lot of pregnant people and we have some people with babies. And so, um, all of you who are joining us, you know, I know many of you gave us questions in advance. So I'm going to be reading lots of these questions, um, and giving them to Julie, who's going to answer your questions. And then if you have a question that comes up today, please use the Q and A that is down, um, on the bottom of your zoom. That's that's the ideal place to put questions for me. If it goes into the chat, I, I might miss it. But if it's directly about something we're talking about, you can put it into the chat. Um, but for a major, just generalized question, put it in the Q&A, please. That would be fantastic. All right, so I'm Jada, founder of Boober and Birthday Presents. Boober is a platform where expectant parents and new families come to find all of their pregnancy to postpartum care providers, such as birth doulas, postpartum doulas, lactation consultants, and mental health therapists who specialize in pregnancy and postpartum. Right now, all of all the services are virtual. Um, we were always an in-person company, but through COVID-19, we have rapidly transformed into virtual support care. So, um, you know, we will go back to in-person care uh, when, when it is safe and we will remain and we'll keep uh, some of our virtual care so we can serve all of you all over the place now. Um, so, um, I'm happy to have you here on birthday presents. I actually just see in the chat, somebody wrote, we took a birthday presents course and we we're so empowered. Thank you. That's so sweet. Um, birthday presents is my other baby. It's our childbirth education company, breastfeeding, newborn care, CPR classes, all to prepare parents and doula training. Um, so really excited to have Julie Rosen here, who is an international board certified lactation consultant. And I'm gonna have Julie, why don't you tell us about yourself a little bit and then I'll start asking you some questions. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Julie uh, Cardonic Rosen, and I've been a board certified lactation consultant for uh, 13 years now. Um, I've worked with Boober for the last few years, um, and most recently, again, transitioned to virtual consults from doing in person consults, which has been really amazing um, work and really incredible to see how helpful um, Boober and uh, the lactation consultants on the platform can continue to be to all of you uh, new parents um, and even um, to some of you who are still expecting your babies. Um, we also do prenatal consults. I just wanna kind of throw that out there. Um, I am a mom of two daughters who are big girls now. Um, they like to cook, I'm finding, during our quarantine together. Um, and um, both breastfed, and they are what started me on this journey to helping new parents with breastfeeding. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you for having me. 
Yeah, we're super happy to have you. And I also want to thank our media sponsor, Park Slope Parents, which is a wonderful community resource, obviously based in Park Slope, Brooklyn, although they have amazing, if you go to parkslopeparents.com, amazing resources for expectant and new parents and are open up to larger surroundings, especially during the virtual times. So, um, so let's go ahead and I, I guess, you know, we could talk a little bit. I would love to just ask you, a lot of people out there are, I think wondering, how does a virtual lactation consult work? First, as I told everybody, we, we were strictly in person and, and we have shifted to virtual care. So I'd like to just have you tell everybody, what does a virtual lactation cons you know, consult look like and, and how do you feel it's been effective? Yeah. Well, I want to say first that I was, I think, just as skeptical as I've heard from other people about how this was all going to work, um, you know, and, and really, um, just, just wondering, like, how, how is it going to work if I can't, you know, get in there and sit next to a, a new parent or new parents on their sofa and talk to them and engage with them, you know, in person and help guide them as to how to latch their babies. And um, it's definitely an adjustment, but I'm finding that it's working really, really well. I really do all the same things, but um, we can do it um, a lot more efficiently um, because I don't have to spend time in my car. And if you've ever been in the New York area, you know that um, you can go on ways and it can say it's gonna take 20 minutes to get somewhere and it can take an hour. Um, and I can get a frantic text from a new parent saying, um, the baby woke up a little early, are you almost here? Um, and you know, doing this from home, I can really be a lot more flexible with the time. So we can um, arrange it for when your baby is really ready to feed. Uh, what I do at first is, um, you know, the baby's starting to wake up, maybe um, the partner is changing a diaper or, um, you know, getting the baby undressed so we can have the baby skin to skin. And I'm talking to the breastfeeding parent about how things have been going. Tell me about how the birth went, um, asking questions about medical history, um, just to, you know, look for any clues as to why there may be some issues with milk supply, perhaps. Um, uh, anything about the birth that might be affecting the way the baby is latching. Um, and so we just talk about everything that's been going on. Um, and then we um, have the partner, ideally there's a partner there or, you know, uh, the breastfeeding parent's mother or sister um, holding the camera so that uh, I can get a nice view of what the breastfeeding parent is doing, how the breastfeeding parent is holding the baby, and I can guide um, with my voice the, the parent's hands um, and, uh, and you know, make suggestions for tips, how to hold um, her breast, how to hold the baby, um, how to support the baby, how to get herself uh, more comfortable, mom more comfortable, um, and, uh, and just pointing out different things that I see. How does the latch look? Uh, when am I hearing swallowing? Um, where does the sucking look like it's happening? Are those good sucks? Are they not such great sucks? How do we improve the situation? So everything that I used to do, um, you know, in, in person, um, I can really do online. Um, yeah. I will have parents send me videos from other times, you know, if I want to take a look at what's going on in the baby's mouth, I'll say, hey, whenever your baby cries, take a video. WhatsApp it to me. I'll take a look. We'll talk about it. All right. the people are probably sending you diapers as well, right? Because exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's not just that consultation um, where I'm engaging with the parents and, and working with them. There's a lot of follow-up. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Even when we were doing in-person consultations, I don't think people realized how much follow-up we do. I'm texting parents you know, regularly. They're texting me. I've seen more dirty diapers on my phone then I carry okay. count um, and little videos of oh, the baby's making this little noise. What do you think that is? And I'll say, just, you know, send me the video. Um, let's talk, let's figure it out. And, and that, that support goes on for, for quite a yeah, while. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lactation consultant also, of course, is that kind of um, advisor of, is this normal in my newborn? Right. Yeah. So I imagine now extra, you know, while there are a lot of parents home for the first time in who knows when, without any help, without any support um, there, I, you know, it seems like the virtual visits are actually providing a whole other layer of emotional kind of support and, and informational support. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can imagine, you know, a lot of parents are feeling kind of alone. I mean, they're not even getting to the pediatrician as frequently right. as, as they were pre-COVID. So, you know, we're lactation consultants are really not just feeding experts. We really are baby experts and we get what normal newborn 
behavior looks like. And, you know, feeding is a big component of what babies do. I mean, we all know they eat all the time, um, but yeah, exactly. But, um, but we, we get babies, we, we know what's normal and, and, you know, what's concerning and we're really there to, to guide parents in that, in that way too. Yeah. And I think one of the other things just for the parents out there, you know, um, that can be helpful if you do end up needing a virtual visit, although we should always say also lots of babies just latch on and feed just fine. I do want to say that, right? (laughs) Plenty of people actually don't need a lactation consultant. That's right. I always like to stress that, like we're here for you if you need it, but a lot of babies, I mean, babies know what to do. Mm -hmm. And there are some problems that like you want to think of your lactation consultant as a troubleshooter. Mm -hmm. Um, there are problems, but plenty of babies will be fine, right? Absolutely. The, the vast majority of them, you have no need for our services. Um, but for those of you that are having any trouble, the sooner you get help, the sooner we can help you fix the problem. Um, I really want to emphasize that, you know, um, people who wait, you know, many weeks with, let's say, a low milk supply situation, it becomes harder and harder to fix, you know, the, the longer people wait. Things you know, it's not necessarily insurmountable, but it's definitely easier to fix pro- problems early on. That's actually one of the things I wanted to kind of talk to you about was this idea. A lot of people expect that, that breastfeeding um, or chest feeding should be painful. Um, and so with that expectation, because it is so common for many people, you know, but I always like to say it's common, but not normal, you know, so should you really be sitting around? How long should you sit around in, in pain before you reach out? I guess I would love to hear your thoughts on, on that. Um, okay, so here's, here's what's really normal. And you're right, um, you know, nipple pain, nipple soreness, even, you know, cracks are really common. That doesn't mean it's normal. So, you know, the first few days, baby is getting your colostrum, which is um, 100% you know, tailored to your baby and what your baby needs and, you know, doesn't need any more. Um, and it's this amazing stuff. There isn't a whole lot of it. Um, baby's learning and you're learning how to latch your baby. And so there can be definitely some transient soreness. We find that babies use a little bit of extra sucking pressure those first couple of days. It's kind of like there's a milkshake and, you know, you're at the bottom of the milkshake. There's just a little bit left and you take your straw and you're kind of, like, you know, you kind of suck in a little harder to get that little bit. So that's what babies do. And so a lot of moms who have some tenderness the first few days will find that once the milk comes in, they're like, oh, okay, that feels better. The baby's not working as hard for every little drop. And it feels like the suction press pressures ease up. What isn't normal, what you shouldn't put up with is, is soreness that really be, um, persists beyond that, especially if, the, if every time you go to latch, it's hurting the whole time. We hear a lot, oh yeah, the first few seconds, I'm like, ah, ah, that's a little, it's a little sensitive. But then it really should ease up once the baby kind of gets into a groove. If that pain is going on the whole time, you want to reach out. If your nipples have cracked or bled, you want to reach out. That, that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. Let's go to one of our questions. So um, I have a newborn and I'm exclusively breastfeeding. She's three weeks, about to be a month, but she tends to fall asleep a lot while feeding. I sometimes feel like she's not getting enough milk since she tends to fall asleep. What can I do to keep her up? And or is seven to 10 minutes okay for her to feed just on one side? Any tips about that would be great. Okay, great. Thanks so much for your question and congratulations on your baby and congratulations to all of you on all all of your babies. Um, So um, here's the thing. Uh, A lot of moms think they don't have enough milk. And I always inquire, you know, tell me what makes you, you think that. Are you comparing her to another baby who feeds in a, in a bit of a different pattern? Or maybe this baby who's getting a lot of bottles and takes a bottle and, you know, sleeps for two or three hours afterward. Um, so, you know, I would want to know kind of why, what makes you think that you may not have enough milk. If your baby's making plenty of diapers, if your baby's been gaining weight appropriately, there's really nothing to be concerned about. It's normal for babies to fall asleep at the breast. There are hormones in breast milk, just like there are hormones that make you feel like cozy and kind of a little sleepy when you breastfeed. There are hormones passing through the milk that make your baby sleepy too. So it's super normal, especially for a baby that young to be falling asleep during breastfeeding. Um, You know, it it happens more at other times, uh, at some times a day than other times. We see it a lot more kind of during cluster feeding that babies are kind of just, you know, lingering there and hanging out at the breast for a long time and just kind of, you know, not being super active and down to business. 
So I would just kind of ask yourself those questions. Is my baby making at least three or four um, good sized poops in 24 hours, that mustardy yellow color? Is he or she making at least six really wet diapers in 24 hours at that age? And do my breasts feel a little bit lighter? Do I feel a little bit lighter, a little bit thirstier after my baby feeds? You know, and if you, the answer to those questions are, are all, you know, positive, then everything's, everything's fine. And just kind of enjoy how yummy it feels to have a nice, cozy, sleepy little baby at your breast. Thank you. All right, here's another question. This is a really common one. Um, I have tried everything to increase my milk supply, increased water intake, healthy eating. I continue to take my prenatal and vitamin D, tea, supplements such as fenugreek, um, blessed thistle, edibles, coconut water, body armor, power pumping after every single feeding, she writes with emphasis on the yeah. Um, are they right? Allowing my baby to nurse as long and as much as he wants. I am exhausted trying to increase my milk supply. Are there any recommendations and is there anything I'm missing? And before you answer that, I want to tell everybody we are doing a building your milk supply class on May 10th. So um, we will send you out that email about that. But yes, this is a really common one, right? So yeah, yeah, it really, really is. Um, so first, again, going back to the other question, you know, ask yourself, okay, Am I sure I don't have enough milk? Am I, are you trying to build up enough milk that you're trying to fill your freezer? You know, is that your goal or is it a true low milk supply situation where, you know, you're supplementing and you're really trying to build your milk and, you know, kudos to you. It sounds like you're really working your tail off to try to, um, you know, increase your milk supply. And, you know, it sounds like you're doing all the things. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out is fenugreek doesn't work for everybody. And in fact, it's contraindicated for some people. Um, anybody who has a thyroid issue, any issue with um, blood sugar regulation or a ragweed allergy really should not be taking uh, fenugreek. So just, you know, something to consider that fenugreek isn't for everybody. Um, you know, I think, um, like I said, you're doing all the things you can do. And to a certain degree, um, you know, everybody's physiology is, is a little Little different with, with regard to milk supply. And you'll hear some moms say, oh, all I had to do was drink the blue Gatorade before I pumped and I doubled my, my output at that pumping. And it's like so frustrating because you do the same thing and, you know, it's not, it's not working for you. So, you know, this is a situation where there might be some, some issue, you know, if there's a true low milk supply situation, you've been doing all the things and you've been pumping and your baby is feeding effectively. Um, you know, he's got a good suck and he's doing all the things he's supposed to be doing and it's just not working. There may be something about your physiology that it's just, it's just not, um, you're not um, responding to all of this good stuff that you're doing. Um, one thing I want to point out is we do need a, a baby who's nursing well. So keeping a baby on your breast for hours at a time may not really be helping you, um, actually, especially if the baby is not really feeding actively. I think a lot of people think if the baby's mouth is on my breast, it means I'm going to increase my supply, but that baby really has to be sucking. You know, this is where pumps can actually be better than, than the baby um, in terms of increasing supply. A pump doesn't get tired, it doesn't fall asleep, it doesn't get bored, it, it keeps going as long as you keep it going. So in some cases, it's better to um, spend your time using the pump than have a baby just staying on for, for a prolonged period of time and not actively sucking. Thank you. That was a great thorough answer. And yes, can be really, really, really challenging, especially, you know, I guess we always ask that question, are you putting that baby to the breast enough? Because sometimes we're just not feeding enough. But like you said, if you're doing all the things, mm -hmm. um, I love, love those different suggestions you give. So um, here's another question. My baby is two weeks old and I've had to triple feed, with breastfeed, uh, breastfeed pump and bottle feed to make sure she's gaining enough weight. She's gaining weight, and now I'd like to wean her off the bottle to exclusively breastfeed. Sometimes she breastfeeds well, but other times she doesn't latch. Any tips for going back to the breasts? Okay. So first of all, kudos to you, because triple feeding is a lot of hard work. Um, it's basically like feeding triplets, um, and we all can imagine how hard that would be. So um, that's terrific that you've really worked um, so hard and built up your milk supply, and now you're trying to wean off. So in terms of getting the baby to take the breast, her state, her, her, um, her demeanor is really, really important. Um, and if she is, um, you know, if, if you're bringing her to the breast at a time that she's super hungry, she's going to be less cooperative. It, you want to have her kind of waking up at the breast. So, you know, right when she's sort of stirring out of her nap, um, it may actually be a good idea to not change her diaper at that point, because that might be too stimulating, might make her too upset, too awake. So if you find that there are times that she just won't take it, 
um, do that, bring her to the breast when she's kind of just waking up, um, let her kind of, you know, latch her on while she's still sort of half asleep and she's gonna be more um, cooperative with taking the breast at that point. Great, thank you. And, my, and here's another one. Um, my baby loves to suck and almost never tells me when he's done by unlatching on his own. He's two weeks old and it's hard for me to tell when he's just using me as a pacifier versus actually eating, even watching the ear, listening for swallowing, et cetera. Therefore, when is the appropriate time to switch sides or when should I end the feeding? Any tips? Um, a good way to kind of get your baby to feed a little more actively or see if maybe it's time to, to switch sides is to kind of squish your breast. Let me pull this down a little bit. Yeah. So if he's on and he's sucking and he's just kind of like falling asleep, if you give some squeezes, right? You're gonna move a little bit of milk into his mouth. Your nipple's gonna tickle the roof of his mouth and stimulate him to suck a little bit more. And that may prompt him to actually say like, no, 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 I, I'm really done. That's, that's cool, like I don't need any more and actually detach on his own. And then he'll probably take a little break, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes and he may start rooting again, and that would be the time that you would offer the other side. Not every baby has to take every breast every time, both breasts every time. Um, the research shows that babies actually um, don't, uh, don't always take one or don't always take both, they sort of alternate. Sometimes they just take one, sometimes they take both. But I always say like, be a good hostess, offer the other side. If he doesn't want it, he's gonna say, you know, no thank you. And I wanna say one other thing about that phrase, using me as a pacifier, because it's a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a, a touchy, touchy phrase for me. Your breast looks like a pacifier, or should I say a pacifier looks like your breast. Your superpower is your ability to pacify your baby at your breast. Love it, embrace it. What an amazing thing to be able to do for your baby, to be able to take a baby who's upset and just put him at the breast, or to be able to help a baby fall asleep by putting him at the breast. It won't last forever, I promise. Um, but don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of letting your baby pacify on your breast. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing skill to be able to have. I, I love that quote. I need that quote, but it, <laughs> your baby, that's your superpower. Love yeah. it. Um, so this is a question. We have some people in the healthcare setting, any special precautions to take while pumping in the healthcare setting upon returning to work during COVID-19? Um, yes, yes. So first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody in healthcare nowadays. You're incredible. I, I can't even, I can't even express how grateful um, those of us who are sitting at home um, are to, to those of you in healthcare settings. So thank you. Um, and um, the answer is yes, so you want to take a little bit of uh, special precautions. So uh, you want to wear a mask uh, when you're pumping. And if you're wearing scrubs or PPE or, or anything like that, you want to kind of, you know, lift it up over your head or, or remove it um, and, uh, you know, have that away from your pumping uh, setup. You want to make sure to wash your hands really, really well um, and uh, before you go to pump. Um, and then you also want to wash the pump parts, uh, you know, in between, in between uses the way that you normally would. Again, hot soapy water. You don't have to boil every part every time. We don't have to do that. You know, uh, we don't have to, to go to that, um, to that extreme. We definitely take everything apart and wash it really, really well. Um, and, uh, you know, just always wash your hands before you pump in general. Um, you know, for every mom, every mom should be, should be washing her hands before she pumps. Thank you. Now we have a question from the, from the group. Um, what does green poop mean? Good question. Um, green poop can mean absolutely nothing other than look, there's green poop. Um, it's normal to have an, an occasional green stool, um, 100%. Uh, consistent green stools um, can indicate uh, a little bit of a sensitivity to a food that um, the breastfeeding parent might be eating or, or if the baby's old enough, uh, something the baby's eating him or herself. Um, it can also, if it's um, copious and it's very frequent, um, and that's all you're seeing is green stools, it can indicate um, that the baby's getting a lot of high lactose milk. Um, that's traditionally called like a four milk, high milk, in, high milk imbalance. And basically what that means is that the baby doesn't, um, is getting a little bit overwhelmed with, with lactose. Milk that's a little thinner, a little waterier, has a higher uh, lactose content, and the baby may just not have enough uh, lactase uh, enzyme in his little system to um, digest all of the lactose. So sometimes you see that as green stools. But as long as your baby is not bothered by it, is gaining weight well, which in general babies are. Babies gain weight, I wanna emphasize this, by the amount of milk they take in 
not because they stayed on the breast for 45 minutes and got extra hind milk. That is like a big fat myth that the woman, Chloe Fisher, the midwife who came up with this concept, wishes that she hadn't, or wishes it hadn't been so, um, so misapplied. So as long as your baby's gaining weight, those green diapers are just, um, just a, a variation and don't worry about them. If your baby's uncomfortable, unhappy, miserable, um, because baby's really gassy, because a lot of extra lactose can ferment and cause gas, then you might want to do things like block feed, um, breastfeed your baby twice on one, on one breast before moving to the other breast for the next two feedings. Um, you know, that, that's a suggestion. But I'm loath to suggest block feeding in the first few weeks while the parent's milk supply is still adjusting. Um, because sometimes it, block feeding can drop the milk supply too, um, too dramatically. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from somebody who is breastfeeding their baby every three hours, now has switched to every two hours during the day in order to have him hopefully sleep longer at night, get a little longer stretch than three hours. But it seems at the end of the day that my breast milk seems to run out and my baby is not fulfilled. What can I do? Um, good question. A lot of women do feel uh, depleted in the evening. Um, and that's typically when cluster feeding happens. So um, baby has been, you know, going reliably every couple hours with nice little, little naps. Um, and then suddenly baby wants to eat for, you know, from like four to eight o'clock. And by the time you get to, you know, 730, you feel like you have empty gym socks uh, in your bra. So the answer is um, just keep feeding the baby. Uh, cluster feeding is really, really normal. In general, the emptier your breasts are the higher the concentration of fat in the milk. And so typically after a cluster feeding period, your baby is going to go a longer stretch of sleep at night. Um, as long as your, I would say, as long as your baby's happy to go back to the breast and isn't complaining and looking at you like, there's nothing left, what's going on here? Um, just keep putting your baby to back to the breast. If your baby's getting really, really fussy, um, you know, maybe pumping and, and offering a bottle at that time, or maybe making sure to sort of have a little bit of extra hydration right before. Some mothers have reported that having like a big glass of coconut water around four o'clock has helped them boost their supply a little bit in the evening. But in general, that's a, you know, that's a really typical pattern that we see that goes on from about a week or two to about three months or so. Um, and it's designed for your, you know, so that your baby will kind of tank up in the evening and then hopefully go that longer stretch of sleep. So sort of Look for that silver lining of hopefully the baby will, will do a longer stretch of sleep after that cluster feeding time. Thank you. So we have a few questions about blebs and clogged milk ducts. So I'm gonna ask one that just came in through the question. Um, have a bleb clogged milk duct that refuses to get better. I've done everything, including in having an OBGYN lance the clogged floor, but the, the pain persists. It's been four weeks now. I'm not sure if you can address that because some of the questions that come in are very individual to yeah. you know, a specific situation, right? And it would be very hard to fully help somebody here um, right. and that you might need to actually seek out a consult, but let's see what, what your answer is. Yeah, um, it sounds, I mean, it, it, blebs can be annoyingly persistent um, and they can keep coming back, unfortunately. Um, something like, you can try something like keeping a cotton ball with a little bit of um, like saturated with vinegar or with um, olive oil in your bra all the time to help keep it from reforming. Um, that's something you can try. Uh, it sounds like though that there may not be um, adequate drainage going on. Um, and so you're kind of backing up a little bit and um, you know, that might be something that you want to, you know, talk to somebody about. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from somebody else here. My baby is 10 weeks and almost 11 pounds. I feel like I breastfeed all the time. That's capitalized. Mm -hmm. I'm worried that I may be making my baby eat too much and put on too much weight. But at this stage, there's nothing else but sleep and eat that a baby can do. Plus, she was a preemie at 33 weeks and is in the 95th percentile of her preemie group. Wow, great. Good Any for you. Okay, well, terrific. Um, what an amazing story you have that you had, you know, this, this, uh, very challenging start and you've got a baby in the 95th percentile. That's amazing. Um, you know, you really, you really can't overfeed a breastfed baby. Um, there's no such thing, you know, she's going to fall onto her curve. Um, she's not going to be a hundred pounds at a year old, I promise. Um, so, you know, try not to worry about that. Um, 
you know, if she's happy with the way that things are going uh, and you're okay with the way things are going, you, you really, you know, we come in all different shapes and sizes and we all grow a little differently. So there's really, you know, it sounds like she's doing great. I mean, did, did, did the, I'm sorry, did the question say anybody would like that the baby was fussy about this at all? I think it was just a question of, I'm worried, am I feeding the baby too much? No, I mean, you, you really can't. I mean, you know, that's the thing is that babies, um, you know, in general, they can really control the flow. I mean, we do have some moms who have like big oversupply, really active let down. Um, but if your baby's comfortably feeding, she's not gagging or choking, you know, she's really controlling what she wants and what she needs. And, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Sears said it, I didn't come up with this phrase, but I love it, which is that a baby's wants are the same as his or her needs under a year old. So if she is asking to feed, then, you know, they need to feed and, and I would just, I would just feed her. Yeah. Um, sounds like everything's good. If it, if on the other hand, just to address that, if, if the baby does seem uncomfortable, unhappy, like it's coming out too quickly, um, leaning back, it's like the easiest thing in the world to do. And it can really work. Just, you can Google laid back breastfeeding and cuddle your baby in like that. And it just takes gravity out of the equation a little bit, makes the a very fast flow a bit more manageable for baby. So, you know, something to try. Well, thank you, because that's a perfect segue. We have a question from somebody here who's asking actually about a forceful letdown, which I think you just kind of answered that a little bit, but let me give you the whole question. Yeah. My five-week-old keeps choking and coughing, clicking while sucking, angry while waiting for me to hand express, and then not opening wide enough to latch. He keeps releasing the latch, tiring himself out, so he's waking up very often and is hungry quickly. Um, forceful letdown, or is there something else that you might hear in there? Um, hmm. I mean, sometimes the clicking is because the baby is purposefully detaching to try to like dam that fast flow, you know, um, so he doesn't choke. Um, but it sounds like there could be a sucking issue there. Um, because usually by five weeks, babies will have figured out how to manage a mom's flow. Um, sometimes cases of forceful letdown are not really forceful letdown. They're just forceful to that baby. Um, they're not like intrinsically forceful. So it could be that, that your baby has a particular issue that's making it um, challenging for him to manage your flow. So that would be something, you know, that, that, that would kind of be a perfect thing for, you know, somebody like me to want to see a feeding and um, go through a whole history of, you know, weight gain and all that and, and see, you know, what's really going on. Yeah, so for anybody out there who is having a really specific concern, you may want to reach out to us um, if you do want to, you know, you can always reach out to Boober and, and ask for Julie if you want to um, connect with, with her or if she's not available, many, you know, great people on the platform. But yeah, you can just reach out to us and fill out the lactation form and we will, we will connect to you um, if you need more, more specific care. So, so many amazing questions. Um, more questions here. I don't even, we probably will not get to all of them. Um, so there's a question about um, nursing newborn twins do you in the first week of June. So if you could talk a little bit, just, just a few basics about twins and getting yeah, ready. Yeah, um, that's amazing. Um, you know, it, um, how things go is kind of gonna depend on when they arrive, right? So if they're full term, um, you know, ideally you want to um, breastfeed them right away. Um, if for any reason they have to be, um, you know, if they're, if they're a little preterm and they have to be taken to the nursery for a bit, maybe spend, um, a little time there or have any issues with jaundice and have to be separated for any reason, very important to pump. Um, but you know, this, I can speak to, to twins the way that I would sort of speak to any breastfeeding situation, which is you're really calibrating your milk supply in those early days and, and weeks. And so the more um, you nurse, the more you pump, if you're separated from your babies, uh, the more milk you're gonna have. And um, you know, many moms can make enough milk to feed two babies, even when they only have one baby. Um, twins are, are just you know, a variation of normal. You've got two breasts to work with. So um, get yourself a great twins nursing pillow. Um, you're gonna maybe a football hold where you know each twin is kind of you know to your side is probably gonna work best at the beginning, um, and just kind of you know breastfeed as much as you possibly can. Have people or your partner you know uh, um, if you can't you know if you don't can't if that's the only help that um, that is available to you in, in these you know challenging times. 
have lots of, uh, bring you lots of healthful snacks, tons of water. You're going to be, you know, really thirsty. Um, most breastfeeding moms are really thirsty and you're going to be really thirsty times two. So, you know, when you're sitting there on the sofa and you're breastfeeding both your twins and you may not have a hand free, really helpful to have somebody bringing you snacks or laying them out beforehand, have your remote control nearby, have your phone nearby. Um, but basically, uh, you know, kind of the same general principles, just um, breastfeeding or pumping if you're separated as, as much as humanly possible. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple questions that have come in about pumping. You know, do I, so when I have a baby, am I supposed to pump also? You know, do I start pumping right away? A lot of people asking variations on when should I begin pumping. Could you address that for the group? Um, good question. Um, we have lots of great pumps available to us nowadays and people like really love their pumps I'm finding these days. Um, if your baby is breastfeeding well, there is no reason for you to pick up your pump um, for at least the first couple of weeks after birth. Uh, if you have a plan to go back to work, I recently worked with a physician who has to go back uh, into the hospital by six weeks. She needs to start pumping around, you know, three weeks to start putting away a stash for that first day that she's in the hospital um, and she's working. Uh, but in general, you know, no, I mean, a, a well nursing baby is going to be enough to um, stimulate a good milk supply. If you have to be supplementing your baby, that's a different story. Um, my, you know, the rule of thumb is really every time you're supplementing, um, you also want to be pumping um, because that supplement represents, um, you know, milk that you're trying to uh, stimulate. Um, and so you want to do that with your pump. Um, you know, in terms of like having a lot of stuff in the freezer just in case, I mean, you know, it's really not necessary. And in fact, it can um, lead to a dependence on your pump. So I worked with mom recently who's making like 80 ounces of milk a day and really trying to wean down from that. She's really uncomfortable all the time because in the beginning she was just pumping constantly, 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 and sort of just to, until she felt completely deflated. And the truth is there's really no such thing as a truly empty breast. If you keep pumping until you, you know, I mean, you're always gonna be able to get drops out. And so what you're doing is just telling your body, no, I need you to feed like quadruplets, you know, and, and it can be really um, hard to get out of that cycle uh, once you get into it. So I would say, you know, unless you have to stay away from your pump um, for the first few weeks. And then if you're going back to work and you want to start creating a stash, maybe pumping like once a day in the morning when you still feel pretty full after a feeding um, um, you know, people who are, are breastfeeding or chest feeding tend to feel the most full uh, you know, kind of early in the morning, eight o'clock. And that's because the milk making hormone peaks in the middle of the night uh, after you've gotten some sleep also. You're not getting a lot of sleep, I know, but after you've gotten some sleep, it does, it does um, help your body to, uh, you know, to start to produce uh, more milk, your prolactin's really high. And so a lot of um, moms find that they're able to pump off an ounce or two after a morning feeding and you can start creating a little stash that way. But pumping after every feeding or many feedings, and you know, unless you're supplementing your baby, is is not really advisable. Yeah, thank you. Um, so somebody asked that my son is now six weeks. He's been feeding for thirty to forty five minutes each session. He's actively sucking the whole time, and I know he's getting a good amount of milk. Is this normal, or could this be a growth spurt? Because those those feeds are longer. Yeah. Um, if your baby was feeding, you know, uh, for shorter periods of time, and now has ramped up to thirty five to forty minutes, yeah, around six weeks, there's a pretty significant growth spurt. Um, you know, again, if your baby, I know I'm sound like a broken record, but if your baby's making um, the right number of diapers and, you know, gaining weight and seems satisfied after feedings, that's totally fine. But yeah, those, and that six week growth spurt can last like several days and, and feedings can be longer and, and more frequent for sure. Thank you. But like all um, things parenting, it will pass. Right. Um, so somebody was told, um, starting at 30 weeks to take a soft and new toothbrush and brush the nipples in the shower to help prevent the prepare the nipples. Is this an old wives tale or is there anything I need to do to prepare? It is absolutely an old wives tale. It is a really uncomfortable old wives tale. <laughs> Please feel free to ignore it. Please do ignore it. Um, there is nothing you need to do to prepare your nipples. Um, it was, there was this belief, uh, that, you know, your nipples should be calloused before you start breastfeeding. Um, and uh, no, absolutely not. Um, we, we don't want to be doing that to our nipples. 100%. I actually, I found, 
I found a book from the 40s that talked about using um, steel wool to brush your nipples. Can you imagine? And and then to air dry them in the sunlight. Um, anyway, we know that, yes, don't do that. Do not do that. Don't do that. There's nothing you need to do to prepare nothing. your breasts for breastfeeding other than educate yourself about breastfeeding. You know, it's good to kind of know what's normal, what to expect, um, but nothing specifically that you need to do for your breasts. Even, I just want to say this, it wasn't asked, but even... Um, for those parents who have inverted nipples or flat nipples, um, there are certain exercises that used to be recommended and those are not recommended anymore. They have not been shown to be beneficial at um, averting nipples, at pulling out nipples. There is a product and I, I don't, I'm not on anybody's payroll, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not chilling for this product, but there is a product that, that some parents find really helpful um, and um, they're called supple cups. And if you have a truly inverted nipple, you may want to look into this product. Um, there are some parents who've had success using it um, in the last few weeks before birth to, to, to try to help uh, uh, invert an inverted nipple. Because inverted nipples, truly inverted nipples, can present a little bit of a difficulty for, um, for, the, the, um, for a baby in latching on. Um, so that would be kind of the one exception to, you know, there's nothing you need to do to prepare your nipples for, for breastfeeding. Speaking of that, somebody had an interesting question here whose family is um, from, from Italy and they were wondering about the, um, the silver nipple, the sterling silver nipple covers that- Silverettes? What is that called again? The silverettes? Yes, yeah, 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 silverettes. Um, that, yeah, can you talk about that a little bit if you have any experience or no? They are phenomenal, but they're expensive. Um, they're like 60 bucks for two um, and they are really great at healing um, difficult nipple wounds. Um, silver ha is antibacterial properties. And I did have a client recently who used it um, and, on the advice of her midwife, actually. Um, and then she came to me for help with latching afterward. And um, she said in 24 hours, it did more than everything else that she had done over the previous few days. So, you know, if somebody feels like spending the money to have something like that in the house and they do suffer damaged nipples, it's, it's, a, really, um, it's, a, it's a really great product. Interesting. I'm glad glad to hear. Um, but if somebody really is dealing with majorly damaged nipples, that is really an indication that they need to solve the latch, right? Yes, ab one hundred percent. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I feel like people are always asking, like, how do I cure that problem, right? And we do want to do things to help cure. cure. Yes. Heal. But same. we also need to fix that fundamental thing. What, what caused that in the first place, right? Yeah, yeah. If, I would say if nipples are getting, have gotten bad enough that you're ordering silverettes, you need to speak with somebody um, right. because, it, because it's probably going to get that bad again once you start, you know, if, if you've taken, let's say, a break from breastfeeding and you're just pumping, like we, you don't want to get into that situation again. So um, I, I do recommend reaching out if, if nipples have gotten that bad. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So a couple other things. Let's see. Well, we had a couple questions that came in um, both today on the chat and also um, submitted ahead of time about um, mastitis. So a few people who are asking, can you help? Like, I, you know, they've had a recurrent mastitis or they feel like they have major oversupply and have led to clogged ducts and mastitis. Can you just talk a little bit about mastitis? Yes. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, some people are just uh, prone to it um, by virtue of having a lot of milk. And so they can't really go um, kind of, you know, like if their baby starts sleeping through the night, you know, or sleeping a longer stretch, they, they wake up and with a bad clogged duct and, and you know, and end up developing mastitis. Um, it's not something that happens to everybody, but it does seem to happen to about 20% of breastfeeding parents in, in the first couple of months. Um, the way that you can tell the difference between a clogged duct and mastitis is you really feel lousy with mastitis. You tend to have um, red streaks on your breast. It's, it's almost always just in the one breast um, and not in both breasts, but it, it can be in both breasts. Um, and it, it can really hurt to even lift up your arm. Um, the whole breast feels uh, swollen. Um, you may run a, a fever of like 100, 101, and just you just generally feel really unwell. You want to try to get to a clogged duct and resolve it so it doesn't develop into mastitis. Um, but not every case of mastitis develops because a parent had a clogged duct. Um, so, you know, your breasts um, can get lump. I mean, everybody who's breastfeeding or chest feeding their breasts can be lumpy. But when we talk about a clogged duct, we're talking about um, an area that's painful, that feels 
often like a wedge-like area of tissue where the milk has backed up. And you wanna put some olive oil on your fingers because you don't wanna irritate your skin when you massage. And you wanna massage, but the tissue is delicate. You don't wanna be bruising your tissue. You don't wanna be um, causing more pain or inflammation. Um, if you do something like Motrin, if, if you're allowed to take Motrin um, can be helpful. And some um, parents find that they have to take a supplement because they're just very prone to plug ducts that, that does help them um, to uh, re help to reduce the incidence of plug ducts. And the supplement is called lecithin. Uh, it's made either in a soy um, base or a sunflower base. And um, it's just a food additive that emulsifies the fat in, um, you know, in, the, in your milk. Um, it emulsifies the fat in like a chocolate bar, so it's not all clumped together. The fat, um, you'll see it at the end of a you know, Hershey bar. And so it can help to kind of break up those clogs and even prevent them. Um, some people say choline um, is, is also a supplement that you could take that's rich in lecithin um, if you can't find the lecithin. So you know, preventing them, working on them when you get them so they don't develop into mastitis. And then you know, making sure your baby is nursing effectively, you know, a baby who's not... Um, you know, draining the breast well, taking out enough milk. And I always say, you know, draining doesn't mean to complete empty. Your breasts are still going to feel a little bit lumpy and that's very normal when you're lactating, but you know, where the baby is effectively feeding. Um, you don't want to be using um, a ton of heat all the time because that can increase inflammation, um, but targeted heat uh, on, the, on that plug. And my favorite um, heat pack is to take one of your baby's diapers Fill it with water, put it in the microwave for like 20 seconds, apply the wet side, make sure it's not too hot, but apply it to the plug um, right before you massage and, and pump or breastfeed your baby, and that can help loosen up the plug. If you do develop mastitis, you want to call your care provider because it can worsen into something called an abscess. Some cases of mastitis can be managed, um, you know, just conservatively with more breastfeeding, more pumping, um, massaging out the clogs, drinking a lot of fluid, resting as if you, you know, you were had, had a virus, um, and others do need antibiotics. Often you'll, what will happen is you'll call the OB, they'll call in the prescription, they don't, most of the time they don't require that you come in, you'll have the prescription, and if things are getting worse or they're not getting better within a certain period of time, and again, your OB can tell you what that is, um, then you will take the prescription. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answered the question. So Thank you. General okay. about so, so many questions here, um, but we have to finish up. So I'll give you one more question that, that came in from a lot of different people about what they can eat while, while lactating, while breastfeeding. So some people had the question of, can I drink alcohol? When can I? Can I drink caffeine? What about all the stuff you told me not to eat when I was pregnant? Can I just start eating that right away? Um, and what about, you know, if my baby has an allergy, how long do I have to stop a food? Just general, if you could kind of address all of those general food and drinking questions. Sure, sure. Um, the good news is that um, anything that you couldn't eat when you were pregnant is totally back on now that you're breastfeeding. You know, parents seem to love to run towards sushi after they have, have babies for some reason. Um, but yeah, you can eat whatever you want. Um, it's a good idea to sort of limit um, high mercury uh, foods for your own health um, and, you know, and for breastfeeding. But uh, again, you know, it's the things that, you, that were dangerous during pregnancy are totally back on. Even coffee. Um, the research that I'm aware of around coffee, you know, said that really, uh, you know, five cups a day, it, they didn't seem to see any effect on the baby, which is a lot of coffee. I mean, it's a lot of coffee, a lot of coffee. So, um, in the first month, I think it's a good idea to be more moderate with coffee. Just, you know, babies can, can react a little bit more in the first month. Um, pretty much every food is innocent until proven guilty in terms of, um, causing any baby fussiness. And if there is a guilty food, it's almost always cow's milk protein. Um, not the cow's milk, not the enzyme, not the lack, you know, not, um, you know, getting like lactose free milk is not going to help in that situation. It's just, you just have to eliminate all cow's milk and give it, you know, at least a few days and many, and many sources say a couple of weeks before you're going to see if that's what's causing your baby's fussiness. And about 30% of babies who are sensitive to cow's milk um, that the parent, uh, the breastfeeding parent is, is intaking, are also going to be sensitive to soy protein. So you don't wanna then load up on soy after you've given up dairy. But I would recommend don't give anything up 
um, until you kind of see what's going on. And, and with babies, we don't seem to see that they get fussy um, from something in your diet until about two weeks. It seems to take about that long, um, two weeks after, after birth before they start getting fussy from something that you're eating. Um, so again, please don't limit yourself in that respect. Um, with regard to alcohol, that's a little trickier. And we have lots of different um, you know, organizations saying different things. And then you have Dr. Jack Newman, who's a um, pediatrician and lactation consultant in Canada, who thinks that you know, um, breastfeeding parents um, shouldn't even worry about it and should, you know, and should drink and if they wanna drink and, and don't really worry about it. Um, I, um, I uh, recently read something by somebody named Ted Greiner, G-R-E-I-N-E-R, where it was a really nice comprehensive article where he surveys the literature on um, breastfeeding parents and alcohol. And um, there, were, there was some really interesting uh, information there about um, different um, behavioral effects on, on babies after mothers drank. And so it's not 100% cut and dry, um, but I, I can tell you a, a couple of things for sure. You do not need to pump and dump your milk if you've had an alcoholic drink. Milk leaves, uh, I'm sorry, alcohol leaves your milk at the same rate that it leaves your blood. And so it doesn't just like fill up your, in your milk as though your milk are these you know, containers for alcohol. And if you just kind of pump it out, it's all gone after five minutes. It doesn't work that way. Um, and it peaks in your, uh, if you have a drink, it peaks in your milk around 30 to 60 minutes after you've, you've taken that drink. The amount of alcohol that passes through is, is really very small. Um, it really, really is. Um, so, you know, in general, um, very moderate, you know, mild to, you know, to moderate drinking is, is really not going to be a problem is, is kind of what most sources say, certainly not a long-term, uh, problem. Um, and, uh, but you know, if you're concerned, you know, you might want to time it, um, so that you are drinking that glass of wine while you're breastfeeding or right. That's what I always say. Like while you're actually breastfeeding is the best time. Right. But yeah. it, it surely might look a little off, but. Oh, you know, whatever that that's multitasking right there. Right. Baby in one arm, the glass of wine in the other. Um, so, uh, you know, I would, I and read that. I would encourage you to read that, um, that report by, uh, that article by Ted Greiner, because, um, it's really nice and comprehensive from what I thought. So, uh, from, from what I've, everything I've seen, um, and then, you know, kind of make that decision for your, for yourself. All right. Well, thank you so much to Julie Rosen, IBCLC. Um, you see here and I'll just write it down so you can all although it's there, I think, IBCLC, Julie Rosen, IBCLC, um, who is available for consults if you need further care, just come visit getboober.com. And um, we thank you all for spending this evening with us. And please, you know, join us at our next series of webinars at our milk supply class. Um, we're here for you. If you can't find a resource that you need wherever you are, even if we don't match to that particular resource, we will try to research ourselves and find you what you need. So you have my email there. Um, you can reach out and, and we're here for you. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank and you. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Take care. care. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad, yeah. Let me know if this was helpful. I always like to hear how, how these webinars have been going for people as you're signing off. Oh, good. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Bernice and Charlene. And anything else you wanna you want us to do a webinar on, you know, tell us, tell us what you need. Thanks, Rachel.